Hey, what's up everybody? This is Clint Lash, and what I have for you today is part two of my uh, little series I'm doing on blind versus blind play. Um, in part one, I spoke about you know, playing out of the small blind, and in general, just, just gave you some strategies and general considerations to make when playing out of the small blind, and how to use utilize HUD stats to make some more optimal plays and specifically you know we got into when race folding might be better than just shoving all in or playing against loose opponents maybe we could start using some limping type of strat uh, excuse me some limping strategies to um, you know to, to start stealing pots essentially so you know it's all villain dependent stat dependent situation dependent and stack size dependent so you don't always want to go into every single scenario saying I'm going to raise, 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 and that's all I can do with my good hands, half decent hands, otherwise I have to fold. Um, so that's what we talked about in the last, you know, in part one of this, uh, of this series. And I also referenced several times my uh, sit and go series I did, the, uh, the five part next level of sit and go play series. And because in that series I get into more detail on the calculations. Um, and specifically in video three and video four about you know when, why, uh, when and why to make some of these plays and, and using calculations to justify them in that you know you might be leaving a lot of money on the table by not playing a solid small blind game. Um, and when I say small blind game again, I mean an unopened pot that's folded to you. What should you do in in small blind versus big blind uh, scenarios? Um, I thought that the next natural part to this video should take the strategies I spoke about in part one, and let's apply them now to real hand history examples. Um, and that's what we're going to do today. So no general strategies. We're just going to go through hands. I'm going to talk about what I'm seeing at the tables, what I'm seeing in the stats. And what my thought process is when I'm presented with, um, you know, different scenarios. So, let's just jump right into it. All right. So here, you know, I pulled up my uh, Hold'em Manager, and you'll see there's just my last hundred hands. And I only did one thing here to filter these hands. Um, I just went to all my games, hit, um, you know, edit my filter. And all I really wanted to do was just see, you know, filter out hands where I have eight big blinds or more. I don't want to get into too many short stack scenarios because then everything becomes pretty easy with just pushing or folding. Um, I wanted to see more than three players. Most of the games you're going to see are typically six or nine man games. That's mainly all that's running on Merge where, uh, where I've mainly been playing. Um, so just wanted to, you know, not have any heads up scenarios. And, you know, obviously three-handed is the bubble for six max, but, uh, and the bubble brings some different scenarios, which I'll talk about if it pops up. But, um, you know, more than three players, more than eight big blinds in, in the small blind in unopened pots. So that's essentially what we're looking at and, you know, voluntarily putting money into the pot. So it's folded to us and figuring out what we need to do in the small blind. So I will just uh, close that and all these hands popped up so I'm not going to filter through the specific hands and only show you which hands worked well which hands didn't I think it's good to just pop open all, all the different hands talk about spots where uh, things went well and also where they didn't go well you know I think it's also important to show where I messed up as well because even when I was going through these hands I was thinking to myself well I'd probably play this differently you know looking back on it maybe it was a multi tabling mistake maybe it was I just made a mistake, didn't look at the right stats. Um, you know, so I think that'll be good to discuss as well. So let's pull that up as well. All right. Now, what I did was, though, I just did a quick filter. So we're going to go from blind level 1020 all the way up through big blind 100, 200 plus. And as I, I say in a lot of these videos that I make, you know, especially when we're talking about specific strategies and exploiting players, that it doesn't really matter what type of sit-and-go you're playing. Six max, nine man, 18 man, 180 man, whatever. Um, small blind scenarios are small blind scenarios. You know, obviously if you're in a 180 man, maybe you have some more chip EV stuff, you could shove wider. I get it. Um, 
but in general, you know, these considerations can be applied to any sit and go for that matter. So even though these are six and nine man games, they can be applied to any uh, any sit and go for that matter. MTT it doesn't really matter. Um, so we'll start with at the ten twenty level and move up because. While the 1020 level might seem easy to many players and it's, you know, you should be playing tight, only good hands. One, that doesn't mean we just need to fold through. I'm going to pick up chips where I can. But I also see a lot of mistakes made in, in terms of how to play out of the small blind. I see a lot of guys raising when they shouldn't. Um, and I'll talk about that as it comes up. So let's, uh, let's see what we got here with Ace King. Pretty standard, raising with Ace King. And like I said, some of these are going to be pretty standard. I'm just going to fly through them. Pretty standard stuff. You know, with the good hands against, let's just put it this way, good hands against regs especially, I'm going to raise. You know, less likely to, to play post-flop. I'm fine if they just want to give me the, the 30 chips here. I'll take them. You know, 15-11. Uh, just raising. So then that brings us to situations like this. And, and this, these are situations I see a lot. Um, you know, in terms of you're in the small blind with a mediocre hand, like an ace five type hand, and you're up against a guy who's playing thirty nine seventeen, and you know I won't go through every stat here. We won't need every stat, but I'll just reference the main ones. So thirty nine seventeen obviously is V pip and pre flop raise. The other stats that I look at are you know the, the fold versus steal, and so if I look at the and that's what this forty number is here. If I look at forty. It's showing that in 21 opportunities, um, if I break it down in the small blind versus big blind, he's only folding versus a steal 38% of the time. So that's that can make things a little bit nasty, give us some headaches by raising, having him call, and then we're playing post-flop at a position with a hand that doesn't really flop well. Um, that doesn't also that doesn't really mean that we we have to fold either. Um, you know, so I like to just limp in, do like a limp steal, um, see some flops. I'm happy to see flops against bad fishy players who are capable of, you know, where I'm capable of getting value off of them when I hit top pair or even second pair. There's just a lot of value in playing pots with these guys. You know that the poorer players at the table, they're going to be spewing chips all over the place. So all I want to do is put myself in good position to maximize my opportunity to pick up chips off of these players. And hopefully they're spewing those chips to me and not anybody else. So these five suited, it's okay. Maybe it's the best hand. Um, I don't necessarily like to risk too much in awkward scenarios in the early game. So I'll just limp in and do my normal limp steal. And, you know, we'll take it down. You know, I'll take a couple extra chips. And, and what I always say is, you know, think about by the time you get to big blind fi uh, 100 or big blind 150, what kind of stack do you want? Do you want a 1300 stack or a 1700 stack? The obvious answer is the 1700 stack, but the way to get there is by picking up chips through the early and, and mid game. You know, so I'm always looking for opportunities to pick up chips. So that's one of those spots. So... Uh, this will come up again, so I'll just keep mentioning it as it comes up. Hopefully we get the stats to change here shortly. So here we just have a uh, short stack shove. I guess I got short stack there, no big deal. Um, again, you know, I'm facing a guy playing 27, 13, 900 stack. He's getting a little bit shorter. You know, I, I don't mind looking to to play hands against them that with with hands that can flop well, that that can flop okay, that has some equity post flop. Um, you know, that, and like I said, just get some value off these guys. But um, but like I said, I I don't want to necessarily be raising at this stage into them. I think that uh, you know it can result in in a lot of headaches just by getting to post flop scenarios against unknown players. Maybe they're calling stations, um, you know, which is good when you hit your hand, but you don't want to be leaking too many chips with, uh, you know, in multiple C betting scenarios. So I just do my normal thing, do a limp steal, and we'll get into more of the limp steal as the blinds get bigger, and obviously the pot's a little bit more valuable as well. Um, here, um, you know, we had ace five before. Now I have ace deuce. Why would I raise? 
I'm playing a guy here who's playing 18-17. This isn't a loose passive guy. This isn't a guy playing 37-3. If, if I had this guy in the big blind playing 37-3, there's no way I'd be raising with ace-deuce. But I've got a guy who's got an 81% fold versus steel. Um, you know, it's the early game. I'm not sure. I mean, he's got reggae stats. I'm not sure how good he is. Um, you know, but I know if he's got these stats, he's typically not going to play a lot post-flop. And, you know, I'll take chips. No big deal. Cali Raider is the same thing. 14-11. I'm just stealing from them the whole time. No limping versus those players. You know, Anton's a reg. Um... I think I'll probably just end up putting them all in. Yeah, he was a short stack. But normally I just raise against him. Um, eh, looks like that worked out well. So now you can see that before with hands like this versus the regs, you know, if Jeff Winger here was in the big blind, I'd probably raise. But since we have a guy that's playing 38-10, this is what I'm talking about, guys. This is why you, This is why I wanted to show all these different, you know, what might seem easy scenarios, but, you know, if you want to even have more control over your game, think a little bit more about your opponents, and, you know, like in this example, I've been raising versus the other guys, well, I'm going to limp now. And we see bet normally, we get called, we have second pair. Um, you know, I won't get into a whole lot of post-flop discussion here, you know, because that'll make uh, <laughs> this video even longer, but... You know, against guys like this, what you have to understand is, I don't think you should necessarily put players like this on hands. I think that's actually a mistake. Too many people try to give random players, these loose players, they do all sorts of wacky stuff. Giving them a specific hand is very difficult and is probably not worth discussing many times. Um, what I do is, I just treat them like the general population of players that are of this player type, meaning... Loose passive, not very good. So what does that tell me? He could simply have a deuce. He could have a draw. He could have a worse six. I just know that there's other hands in his range that I'm actually going to be able to get value from. Um, you know, so I have no problem betting out small. And so in, in scenarios like this where I obviously don't have the best hand in the world, but I do have some showdown value that I could actually get a little bit of value from, I don't mind continuing to bet very small, keeping his worst hands in, allowing them to call. If he raises me at any point, obviously we're getting away from the hand. But um, I, I also don't like getting to check fold mode, or sorry, check call mode too much. I don't want to be checking he bets 80 or 90, whether it's a bluff or not, and having the call and checking again on the river. I'd rather take more control over the hand, even out of position. So I'll keep it at 60, we get a call again. This 8 is probably a good card for us. So I'm not looking to bet real big and turn my hand into a bluff. I'm going to do it as a cent, make another small bet essentially as like a blocker bet, but also a value bet. So no more than 100 here I don't think is necessary. And we bet 90 and we get called from, you know, it looks like he had a nice little draw on the, uh, on the turn, but what he was calling me with on the flop, who knows. But that's what I mean, guys. You know, no need to inflate pots against these guys. Just limp in, do a limp steal. You hit your hand, get a little bit of value. That's what it's all about. And we come to pocket deuces. Pocket pairs are such an interesting hand to play in the early game. And I, I find that, um, you know, it's, it's a hand that's often played randomly. I see a lot of different plays from a lot, a lot of different players about how to play these pocket pairs. Do you limp? Do you raise? Do you just open fold? Um, the answer is, I don't know. It depends on the players, the table. I really change up how I play pocket pairs. But I change it up for a reason, not just um, doing things randomly. So again, against a guy like 19-6, you know, he, he does have an 89% fold versus steal, so maybe I could raise. But against... A guy like this, that's, again, he's not a reg, he's not a winning player just by looking at his stats saying he's loose passive. Um, you have to think about what's the value of hands like pocket deuces, pocket fives. The value of these hands in the early game 
is to hit a set. So I want to, and, and because I know that these types of players are capable of, you know, like we saw with the other guy, going all the way to the river with, with nothing, with just ace high. And if this guy hits top pair, I know he's cap I'm capable of getting his entire stack. So I don't want to limit the amount of hands that he's playing against me. I want to encourage him to play 100% of his range here. So the only way to do that is to just limp versus this guy. Yeah, you have a pocket pair. There's no reason to really raise here. The blinds aren't of much value. You know, if he calls, pocket deuces isn't going to play post play very well post flop. Obviously, when you don't hit a set, so just limp in, let him play his hands. Hopefully, he hits something. We can do our limp type of steal and, and fire out a bet on the flop. If we even if we miss our set, we have some showdown value. But the point is, the value is hitting a set. I want him to, you know. I want to maximize my opportunity for him to hit his hand so that we can get tons of value. Uh, we actually do hit our set here. And he calls. Um, against these guys, I wanted to start getting more chips in the pot, start betting bigger. I usually don't like to check raise against these guys. I th usually think that they'll keep calling. Unfortunately, we get a fold there. So maybe I could have done something a little bit different, but I don't know. When I have a made hand against a bad player, I like to start putting more and more chips in the pot. Okay, so so we get to 2550. 2550 is an interesting blind level, I think. It's where th a lot of things change, in my opinion. Blinds are a little bit more valuable. Um, there isn't, this is when post swap play starts to um, decrease a little bit. You're not at those very early stages. Three betting, many times, will include three betting all in, uh, which you don't see as much at the earlier blind levels. So um, I will typically do a little bit more raising out of the blinds. At starting at 25.50, this guy's a, a 35.19. I decided to raise. Could I have limped with this hand, given that he's a pretty loose player? I could have. I think you know. I, and again, I mentioned in I think is my sit and go series um, three, and then part one of this the series I talk about the best players to do a limp steal against. They're typically your loose passive players, the ones that have a big differential between their V pip and pre flop raise. Um, this guy is loose. He's not as passive as we saw some of the other guys, uh, like single-digit preflop raise numbers. So he's a little bit more aggressive. Maybe that's what I was thinking, that I didn't want him to raise over top of our limp and make things even worse. Um, but also, he does have an 83% fold versus steal. Not many hands, so that's not a huge factor. Um, it's a good hand, though. It could flop well, so I'd rather just raise. We get called... Um, definitely making a C bet. They're calling with such a wide range that you know they're going to be missing so many flops as well that it's not always you know a good hand that's going to flop well. And I think I just kept firing. Um, I'm not going to talk about justifying this triple barrel bluff that ended up working out. Um, Looks like this game was from a few months ago, so I don't know what I was thinking at the time. Maybe I saw him do something before. Um, but that one worked out well. So, I won't, like I said, I won't get into too much post-flop play. I just want to give you my thought process. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, social, sa social Assassin is a reg. So, you know, whether I have Ace-9 or not doesn't really matter. I'm raising with pretty much any two cards here because... I know post flop play is going to be limited, so it's nice that I have ace nine, um, but I could have anything there, and I'm going to be raising. Here we go with um, now. I, I find that most guys are going to just fold six four because they don't like the hand. You know, it's a bad hand; it doesn't flop well. I agree. I mean, it's not a very good hand, but let's look at this guy's stats we're playing against. There's no way I'm raising. 28-9, 50% fold versus steal, um, not many hands, but you know these are typically what, what you will see. Um, so there's no point in raising. I don't necessarily care about my hand too much when I'm doing that limp steal type of play because I'm not looking to hit the flop. I'm just banking on him being a passive player, and when he misses the flop two-thirds of the time, many times he will fold. So checks. We fire out you know, a little bit more than half pot. I'm always... Usually right around half pot. I don't like to be make it a lazy bet and just put 50. I like to mix it up, 52, 53. Um, 
And guys, also, an ace is a good card to represent. Most guys will raise with an ace if they have it. So if they didn't raise you when you limped, it's easy to represent this ace. So that's what I'm talking about. You know, that's an extra 75 chips I could put back in our stack. You do that a couple times over the game, and especially as you get 5,100, that's how you start building stacks, guys. You know, instead of just folding and giving the guy directly to my left more chips, I'm taking those chips. I think we saw this guy before, definitely raising him instead of doing the limp. Um, 10 9 Suda does flop well. We're up against a pretty loose player, actually, kind of an aggressive player. Um, could I have raised instead? He's got a 50% fold versus steal, only one opportunity in the big blind. Um, I think I'd probably end up limping here. Yeah, in general, I mean, obviously, we're not going to have ideal, ideal scenarios. Like I said, the, the better players to do a limp steal against are these guys playing like 37-6. This guy is a little bit more aggressive, so there's a chance that he could raise over top of our limp and force us to fold. But our hand can flop well. I'd like to see a flop, see if we can hit something good. So essentially, I'm going to say, hey, well, let's give it a go. Maybe against these guys, I probably would maybe fold like a 6-4 type of hand. And we hit our 9, doesn't really matter. Throwing out about a half pot bet. Maybe I'd like to change it up a little bit, but hopefully you guys are getting the point here about how I'm constantly changing up my play. 18-12, um, 64% fold versus steal overall. I could have raised here, possibly. I'm not familiar with this guy. Um... But given his stats, maybe a raise might have been better. Yeah, he does end up shoving over top. So that might have been a mistake. Maybe I didn't pay attention or didn't know about him. But looking back, I probably would just try to raise versus this guy. But remember, you know, it's it's not about, like, you have to do this play every single time. What I'm hopefully giving you are different plays to make in different scenarios. Try them out. See what works. See what you can get away with. Obviously limping against this guy, playing 32-9. Represent the ace. Or just pretty much just betting because we're assuming he, he didn't hit anything. Um, now, as you can see, the big difference here is Anton FS. He's one of the main regs in these games. Um, no point in limping. He'll raise over time my limp almost every single time. But I know I'm not going to play post-flop versus him because regs don't flat. So... We can just go ahead and raise with Jack-5. Versus if this guy 28-5 was in the big blind, I would do a limp. So you can see, hopefully, that a, how I'm changing up my game. Just based upon those two factors. Reg versus fish or random player. Tight versus loose passive. Hey, it's me again. Another reg. No way I'm limping here. Just raising. Uh, we get kings. This is probably an easy hand. And let's get it all in with them. Good for him. Um, and guys, look, obviously, you know, this is Kings, so this isn't rocket science here, but remember what I said before, you want to play as many hands against these guys as possible, because they're able, you're able to stack them much easier than, than other players that essentially have a clue at the table. So yes, I have Kings, but, you know, that's why I recommend putting yourself in good position, whether it's the limp steal or... You know, not inflating pots with mediocre hands, just waiting to, to hit your hand first. Um, this guy is a loose passive player, so limping in general, but a hand that's strong as king-queen, it can flop really well. I'm happy to raise with good hands. You know, ace-deuce, I'd limp. You know, I'd be like king-five, limp. King-queen, king-jack, those hands are worthy of a, of a raise. So raising was certainly with hands that can flop very well for us. Um, here we go again, pocket threes. Real value is I'm not, I'm not looking to get into a post-flop scenario at a position. Guy's playing 36-8, folding half the time, actually less than half the time in the big blind. You can see there it's 44%. Um, just limp in. And he calls on that board. That's not a good thing for us here. I think I'm just going to check in. You know, you got you to pretty much know when to give it up. 
he calls on a board like this. This maybe he's got a queen, maybe he's got an ace, a flush draw, whatever. <laughs> Anything, everything possible, pretty much completed. No reason to start double and triple barreling here. Just didn't work out. Minimize your risk. And maybe if I kept betting, I would have get him to fold. But you know, obviously in general, not looking to get too crazy here. I think you got to know when to slow down as well. Big Mikey here. Pretty loose player. He actually folds versus a steal quite a bit. Uh, one out of two times in the big blind, so not a lot of information. I like you know having an ace, that's fine. Do a limp steal. Um, I thought there were a couple hands he could have uh, played on the flop here, or just called me with, floated potentially, maybe some draws. I think this is probably where I decided to do a smaller triple ba or double barrel. He decides to raise, so just get out of the way there. And, and again, it's very important when you're doing a limp steal, not everything is going to be perfect. You're not always going to take it down on the flop. You might get into some turn and river scenarios. Sometimes I'm double barreling if I think it's an okay scenario. Uh, usually my double barrel uh, sizing is, is small, no more than 50%. Um, and you also have to be, you know, be sure of, or maybe I shouldn't say be sure, but um, be careful in spots that you don't get too overzealous. Um, know when to get away from a hand. You know, here we lost a few chips. Okay, we're still sitting okay. Don't look to start bluffing these guys too often because, to be honest, they're not bluffing you very often. Sometimes they will. Good for them. You know, in general, they're going to be spewing their chips. So put yourself in good scenarios. Don't guess. Again, I've, obviously there's a lot of limp stealing in these scenarios. Um, so here, we decide to limp against this guy. He's playing 28-14. That's fine. He decided to raise. Not going to call and play out of position. Just know when to get away. Our play didn't work there. No big deal. Um, looks like this will be a spot. Instead of limping, we're going to be stealing. Uh, raise to steal. 82% fold versus steal. 3% 3 betting, so he's not 3 betting very wide versus a steal. So definitely raising there. Um, you also notice my sizing. I typically go 2.2 to 2.5. At 25.50 at these games, sometimes I'll go even the 3x, not make it as enticing for these players to flat me. Um, I know regs don't flat in general, but some of them do once in a while. If it's if, if you're just min raising, it's very easy to flat. I really don't like min raising out of the small blind because it makes it very easy, like I said, for one, guys to just call you, force you to play out of position, which I know I've done on players as well. They try to min-raise out of the blinds, and if I'm deep enough, I don't have no problem flatting and forcing you to play out of position. Um, and also min-raising, you're giving the other player more room to 3-bet, more fold equity potentially to 3-bet. So I like to go a little bit bigger out of the small blind. Um, once it hits 5,100, there's no way I'm going 3x, no more than 250 most likely. 220, <clears throat> 225, 250. Deep Blue Day is a mass tabling reg, raising any two cards versus him. Could I have made it 125 instead? Sure. Um, this guy, I'm not as familiar with him. Um, not a loose passive player. Not a high fold versus steel either, only 60 some percent. Um, but like I said, I always like, I hate giving up the blinds. I always think there's a way to steal it. So in general, I think probably a raise might be better than a limp against this guy. So I'm going to go for it. He decides to three bet there. No big deal. Just get away from the hand. Most times that three bet shove is going to be with a pretty good hand. Um, G cone, not a loose passive player. High fold versus steal. Obviously just, uh, raising there. I would have rather raise there. I don't like to shove here. Um, it's effectively 13 big blinds. It's a plus EV shove, for sure. Uh, but if you remember in my other videos, I talked about, especially of my Sit and Go series, uh, video four, I talk about this play, raising versus shoving, um, you know, with these types of stacks. Typically, I like to raise. Um, a shove isn't bad. A raise is usually more optimal versus tight ABC players. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why I shove there. It's not a bad play. But the question is, is it optimal? And that's what I'm always going for, to make the most profitable play. Um, so not exactly sure, but ended up shoving. 
So maybe that's a hand looking back on, wasn't too excited about. Um, here, you know, blinds are getting a little bit bigger. They're more valuable. But again, we still have guys here that are playing kind of loose. This guy's an 83% fold versus steel. Breaking it down into big blind and small blind, it's really only two out of three times. Not a huge sample. So because it's not a huge sample there, I'm usually looking at their VPIP and preflop raise to get an overall idea of what type of player I'm against. So because I know the general population of these types of players will force you to play post-flop in some scenarios, I decide to do a limp steal. We hit a, we hit top pair there. Um, I think I played this one pretty poorly. Maybe I should have gotten it all in. I think I ended up just calling and hoping that the pot ended up being kind of small. He bets big. I assumed I, I guess I was beat. I decided to get away. Uh, I'm not sure how excited I am about the way I played this. Maybe I was just hoping he would slow it down on the turn, but he didn't. Got away. Essentially, by calling here, I'm, I'm saying that he's bluffing because if he has you know, a lot of tens in his range, they're going to be beating just based upon a kicker. Since I limped, um, since it's a limp pot. That's also another reason why guys you know, shouldn't look to get too aggressive unless they hit their hand. There's really no reason to. Um, so, got out of that with minimal damage, but maybe could have played a little bit better. Ebex is a reg. 80% fold versus steel. A little bit higher 3-bet versus steel, but that's okay. Not 3-betting wide enough to stop us from raising, so... As you can see, I make it 2.5, and just doing a raise there. I think this is a good example. I, th I think this is important to see. Um, I guarantee you most players are folding here because they say 2-4, that's an awful hand. Yeah, it is. It's awful if you're going to play post-flop, but who cares if I'm not going to play post-flop? I'd do the same thing with King-10 that I would do with Deuce-4. I'm going to raise here. Uh, I made it 275. Maybe that's a little bit too big. Um, but the point is, make it 250, whatever you want. Um, I'm not playing post-flop. I'm raising. I'm taking these blinds. You know, if you find yourself folding in these spots versus regs in the big blind, you're giving him 150 chips instead of it being in your stack. That's how you pick up stacks. You know, add that to the rest of the plays. I always talk about it in terms of exploiting players. Um, that's how you build stacks. That's how you come in first place more often. So I guess you can see the pattern here. 28-9 this player is. Um, we're obviously doing a limp steal. And taking it down. So like I said, guys, you know, I didn't filter these hands for um, you know, every pot that I went I won or pots that look good. Obviously, you know, that triple barrel was a weird play. The last hand with the with the ten you know, it was a little bit of a awkward situation. So, this is what I'm doing every day at the tables. You know, this is how I'm playing. You know, it's not just, you know, I talk about, oh, we could do this, we could do that. This is what I'm doing to get higher than normal ROIs um, for myself, for the players I'm coaching, staking. And so here we get the business. Here looks like reg fourteen ten, pretty tight. Um, I decide to raise because again, we're not going to play post flop. If he decides to three bet me like he did here, fine, no big deal. Just folding. Um, and then when you do that as well, that'll give you confidence so that when you hold a hand like Ace Jack here or Pocket Kings or, or Ace King, Ace Queen, you can then just min raise with those hands as well. And if they three bet shove, you can show it down so that you don't fall into a polarizing range where you're always raising to steal, but then when you're in a spot like this, you just shove it all in. So EV Killer is a uh, is another reg, and I decide to, you know, I probably should have, again, made a 250. Um, that's probably a little bit too big. I'm not sure what I was doing that day. Um, maybe it's just the the automatic raise buttons that Merge uses, that were, which are kind of annoying. Um, I decide to raise, and obviously I'm calling any 3-bet here from him. So the plan there was more to induce. Um, 501. This guy, high fold versus steel, 85%. So that's a good sample, guys. Look at that. 36 opportunities in the big blind, 
and he's got an 83% fold in the big blind versus a steal. You should be raising against these guys with any two cards. Looks like I'm in another spot against them. Do the same thing. Same exact thing. You know, the set. There's another reg. Uh, because in this scenario, and I'll get into it, Remember, I've talked about why you can, and in part one, why we can play a more race fold, race call game with 10 and 11 big blinds. I would make this same play if I had deuce four against this guy. It's a perfect spot. Instead of just shoving all in, um, I would do the same thing with deuce four and just raise fold if he three bets. So accordingly, I want to do the same exact thing with pocket tens and hands that I'm willing to raise call with. And Obviously, we don't get anything there, but... I do this so that, again, I don't polarize my range. I don't give any tips to any players that sometimes I'm raising, sometimes I'm shoving. Um, you know, I am going to be doing the same exact thing with all those different types of hands. On tilt players, another reg. Obviously, we're just raising there, standard stuff. Um, I guess this isn't recognized that it was an unopened pot. I think I just want to get into an isolated pot with this guy. I just shove. Fine. It's no big deal. Against Lee Harvey Oswald here. 11 10, 100% fold versus steal. Um, this guy, I'm just raising with any two cards. Pretty easy. This guy, one drop. 39 17. Looks like we are. Um, I think this is a yeah, this is a six max game, so we're not on the bubble yet. I decided to raise against this guy, and obviously looking back, this might not have been the best play. Um, I think I decided to raise because when I looked at his stack, what I said was even if he isn't a great player, um, and they are capable of flatting because he is getting so short. I just didn't expect him to flat. I still thought he would be, if he's figuring I'm going to play this hand, I'm going to three better, I'm going to fold. I didn't expect to play post-flop. If he had like a 1300 stack, I probably would have did a limp steal. But just because I didn't think he was going to flat um, in this scenario with that stack, I thought that the raise would get the job done. <clears throat> but he does end up flatting because that's what these guys do. And then we get this interesting board. What do you have to do? So I got caught here, right? This isn't a great spot. One thing that you have to keep to keep in mind is you have to see bet here. You have no showdown value. He didn't three bet you, so that tells you it's probably not the best hand in the world that he's got. Maybe it's just like pocket fours or who knows what he's got. Um, I am definitely C betting. Now how much to C bet? It doesn't have to be big here. We don't want to make it too big because with his stack He's either going to be all in when he hits his hand, or he's going to be folding when he misses. There's no floating. There's nothing like that because of his stack. So we need to bet a pretty small amount um, because uh, that's what will get the job done. We, that's what you always want to think. Have a game plan for your bet sizing. What amount here can I bet to get the job done? Can I, do I need to bet 250 or 300? I, I don't think so at all. You don't need to go that big to represent anything. If he's got an ace or a jack, he's all in. Otherwise, he's going to fold. So I don't think any more than 200 here is necessary. So we bet 200 if he shoves. We can probably just get away from the hand most likely, even though we have a pair. But we bet you know, 200 there. So Always look at the stack sizes. Playing it blind, I think, is a losing player. Not somebody I want to raise into, so I just do a limp to do a steal. We had top pair, which is fine, but again, that's not always our goal. Standard raise. Um, I decided to shove there. I'm right at 10 big blinds. I decided not to do a raise fold or raise call there. Maybe I could have, looking at 73% fold versus steal. Um, I'm just not as familiar with this guy. And that's the other thing, guys. Like, if you don't know a player, don't try to play this raise, fold, raise, call, fancy type of play when you have 10 big blinds. Make what you know is the plus EV play. In general, I know that shoving all in here with 10 big blinds with Jack-9 is going to be plus EV based upon average calling ranges. I don't know how tight this guy is. 
you know, he's playing 24-18. I, I don't know how reggy or fishy this guy might be. So without a lot of information, I'm just going to play a straightforward shove spot. Um, yeah, eight big blinds versus a loose player. Standard shove. Here you go, guys. Another 4-2 scenario. Um, Asian Clay Haken. Pretty funny name. 16-13. Um, I think this is probably one of those good spots where I could go ahead and and um, fire off a, a raise and didn't think I was going to play post-flop, so we can just raise there. Same thing here. Guy's playing 16-13. You know, only a couple opportunities on a fold versus steal, but so I would just look at 16-13, um, and that works out. Pretty standard spot to just raise. We get three bet by this guy who's a reg, and we can just get out of the way. No big deal. Um, hmm. Looking back, I'm not sure if I'm a huge fan of this raise. 33-11, 86% fold versus steal. Maybe when I was looking at it, I saw that in four opportunities, he folded in the big blind every single time. So maybe that went into my decision-making. I would probably rather do a limp steal here. Um, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of that play. I'd probably do a limp steal, kind of what I've been doing. Um, King Queen though is good enough to play post flop if we get called. So this guy is likely to call 38-10, not folding very often. We get him to fold there, but as you can see, with a good hand that it can flop very well, that's very strong. I'm happy to raise. But you can see Ace Five, same exact guy. Look, just the the slick sofer guy, same guy King Queen. I'm raising. Next time, you know. It's good to also change up your play once in a while that you're not always raising every single time. Um, you know, change up your play a little bit so it's nice to throw in a limp, especially versus these guys. So I decided to limp this time. And so we have some showdown value now with the ace. Um, once he calls our flop bet. You know, that, that's a pretty drawly board. This is kind of nasty. So when you're in a scenario like this, we have top pair, very draw-heavy board on a guy that who knows what he has. What I'm looking to do is get the show down as cheaply as possible. Get, maybe get a little bit of value on the way, but not looking to you know get it all in here with 20 big blinds. So I decided to make a pretty small bet, less than 50%. If he comes over the top, I can't see myself calling here. I mean, he called the flop, then... If he raises the, the turn, which I think he does, yeah. He raises the turn there. Essentially, I th for me to call here or get it all in, I'm saying that I think you're bluffing. I don't think he's bluffing. I'm not willing to risk my pretty comfortable stack at this point in this scenario. So I'll just get away from the hand. Now we have a good hand against a loose player. An interesting play that I like to make when I have good hands like this, when I know they're capable of calling, is actually raise much bigger out of the blinds. Like, not 2.5. I go like 4, 5, 6x. It's a little bit different play. Most of you are probably thinking, what the hell are you talking about? Why would I raise 4 or 5x? Um, Ace-Queen is obviously a very good hand. We're happy to get it all in with Ace-Queen against a guy like this. Um, but that might not be the scenario here if you raise it to, like, let's say 250. You could, this he could flat you, um, and you could be playing post-flop. The difference is with King-Queen, you know, when I had King-Queen, I raised the same amount. I'm not willing to get it all in with King-Queen against this guy. I would be willing to get it all in with Ace-Queen. So that's the difference. King-Queen, I'm happy to play post-flop. Ace-Queen, I want to pretty much put in his mind that if you're going to play this hand, I want all of your chips to do it, or I want you to 3-bet to do it. So I decide to make it a little bit bigger so that he thinks, you know what, if I'm going to play this hand, it's going to be 3-betting with you know, whatever he's got. So I like to mix that in once in a while, change it up. Um, against a loose, kind of aggressive player, no messing around, make your plus EV shove with 10 big blinds with your ace. 
pretty straightforward. And doing again 4018, doing a limp steel, that's the plan. I decided to double barrel there. Um, not sure if this is the greatest double barrel spot or the greatest card. I mean, I mean, even usually like a high card coming out on the turn is good to represent. If an ace comes out, I'm not sure if that would be great for us actually. Um, could he have a four? Could he have a flush draw? I'm not sure if he's going to be going to fold a flush draw. Um, not sure what happened previously in this game. Maybe I saw him do this before. That's another thing, guys. You know, pay attention to um, game dynamics and players. I remember there was one game where. I did a limp steal versus a guy. He called every single time I made a C-bet, uh, where I tried to steal on the flop, but then folded almost every time I double-barreled. So I just kept doing the same exact thing. I made it pretty small, did a half pot on the flop, maybe like 40% on the turn, and got him to fold every time. Not sure if this was that game, but just something to keep in mind. Alright, so in this spot, we've got, again, yeah, it might sound like a broken record by this point, but... I think it's important you see sometimes I'm raising, sometimes I'm limping, sometimes I'm shoving all in. I think it's good to, to kind of put all the, the conversation I've had you know, in the, in the other video about the general strategies and, and really put it to use. So, do a limp steal. He calls on this board. He could be floating. Um, I just don't know if he's ever folding many hands. If he has a deuce, he's never folding. Pocket pair is never folding. If this was a king, ace, king, queen, something like that, I probably would have fired out a double barrel. But because it's a nine, not going to help our cause too much. So just get out of the way. Um, I said the shove here. Looks like a six max. I have the big stack. I could have done a limb steal. I also think um, perfectly fine with this type of hand to shove all in a little bit deeper to 12 big blinds. I'm not sure what happened previously in this game if that made me, you know, shove a little bit wider or not. But uh, plus EV shove there most likely. So if he had 14 or 15 big blinds or something like that, then I think uh, probably doing a limp steal would be better. Uh, looks like we're in the same scenario. Um, so now you can see it's the same table. Maybe this was earlier, later. Who knows? Um, He's got a little bit bigger of a stack. We have jack four. So now I decide to do the limp steal. And I guess I tried to represent the king here with the, the high card. It also completes some potential draws with like jack ten. So we can just get out of the way there. Hence I'm showing up with king jack. So we called. So this is the nice thing, guys, that this is why I like the limp steal in general. He should be raising me here with King Jack, but the fact is that he isn't. So, <laughs> you know, he only has a gut shot here, essentially, um, that he decides to call me with. Fine, he hits his hand, okay. Um, but that's the point, you know, if he doesn't have that gut shot, maybe it's like do 7 9, I'm going to take this pot down. So, a little bit unfortunate there, but that's okay. And you can see the difference, 6-4 versus this guy who, he was showed up in a previous hand um, where I was raising him, 82% fold versus steel, low 3-bet versus steel, that's what the 3.0 is, 21-15, uh, you know, reggie. So, just raising with the 6-4, doing the same thing probably with King Deuce. Um, I'm not sure what happened, I think I ended up shoving all in here, which I am not a fan of, I, I, I don't like to shove at all. I should keep in line with what I was saying before. Play more the more race fold, race call game. So maybe something happened before in this game that got me shorter stacked and I saw him do something. That's why I shoved a little bit deeper. So if like if I saw him flat before and call my raise, which was surprised me at the time, then okay, maybe we could shove a little bit deeper and make it a plus EV shove. If I think he's more standard reg and, and isn't doing that, then I think a race fold would have been much better. Calls me King Deuce as well, so that was interesting. As you can probably guess, the limp steel coming up. 31-6, I don't expect him to raise. When he does raise that big, I also expect uh, that's probably a pretty good hand, so we just get out of the way. 
Ebex definitely raising here. E three bet jams us, so no big deal. Get out of the way. The business. You can see now, this is a play I like better. We're essentially like 10 big blinds effective. He's playing 14-10, pretty tight. He's not folding versus the steal a ton, but I also know I'm not going to play post-flop. Another important factor is I love his stack here. Because he has that 1,500 chip stack um, total, he probably assumes that when I raise here and he 3-bet jams, and given my stack that I'm leaving behind, there's very minimal fold equity. You know, think about if you're this guy and somebody raises and you have this much of a stack left behind you. You usually don't assume much fold equity. You usually assume if I'm going to 3-bet here, I'm happy to show down my hand. So it's usually a, a value 3-bet. Um, because that tightens up their 3-betting range, we can then just play a raise-fold, raise-call game. Would a shove here been plus EV? Sure. This play is much, much more profitable. And, you know, if you just think about it on the surface, let's say you're always shoving in the spot to steal. You're risking your, you know, essentially, you're risking 10 big blinds to win 225 chips. When I make this play, I'm risking 375 chips to win the, three, to win the 225. I'm risking a lot less to win the same amount. And that's how you can make more money at these games. Um, I think he's getting a little bit shorter now, so we just make a shove. I probably should have just raised there, to be honest with you, but that's fine. Um, I don't really like my shove here. Now, again, I don't know what happened previously. If I saw that this guy was flatting and do a lot of weird stuff, then I like just playing unexploitable and letting him get it all in with a, with a worse hand than ace-jack. If he truly is playing just 18-13, 82% fold versus steal, no 3-betting, then I like just raising and playing a more race-fold, race-call game with 100% of my range. Calling, obviously, with ace-jack, folding, bad hands. So, not a fan of that shove. I did it again, so I guess maybe something happened earlier in that game that caused me to do that. Um, I tried the limp steal on him. Works out. Maybe next time I could probably put in a raise with those stats. Here I raised him again. I think I raised him here because I really like the stacks to do it with. It looks like he doesn't have any fold equity, so his 3-betting should be pretty tight. So as you can see, I'm changing it up a little bit. You know, really thinking through the plays, usually, obviously there's some plays looking back on, you know, I could have done something a little bit different. Um, that's okay, that'll happen. You know, I don't play perfectly 100% of the time. But I am trying to make plays all the time that I know will be plus EV at that time. You know, so here, hey, it's me again. Um, pretty standard raise here, even though we're kind of deep. Yeah, I ended up folding here. I don't think I want to get into a... 20 big blind battle with ace jack. I don't really know how wide he's capable of 3 betting me. In general, he's pretty tight. So I decided to just fold ace jack there. Could that been a could that have been a call? Sure. I'm again, I don't assume. I mean, maybe I just didn't know at this time. I still don't know how wide necessarily he's shoving against me. Until I know he's capable of shoving really, really wide, I'm not going to be calling marginally. So I only uh would call off that deep if I knew he was really wide there. 15-4, loose, you know, just pass a player. And he calls on this board. I actually kind of like this board, and I love the turn card. If he has any type of diamond, he's probably calling on the flop. We can now represent the ace and probably get him to fold a lot of draws as well. So that's why I like to fire out again. I think that's a good spot to double barrel. So if you are doing the limp steal and you've been trying to do it, don't always feel you have to give up on the flop every single time. If you are, then you're probably just leaving some chips on the table. Try to pick some good spots to do a double barrel. Um, so here I make it a little bit bigger, 3x. Again, this is a um, you know a random player, loose player. I raise it to 3x hoping that with his stack, he's not going to flat. If he's going to play a hand that 
because I bet so big, he realizes he has to put all his chips in to play this hand. That's what I really want. So I kind of force that action. And we get it all in with sixes. And of course we hit our queen. Run good a little bit. Um, pretty standard shove there. Versus a reg. Asian Clay Aiken. This is what I like better. Playing a more race fold game with my entire range with his 10, 11 big blind stack. So if he shoves, we're calling. And again, that gives me confidence that I can also do that with four deuce. That I know I'm going to do it with both hands. Um, could have shoved, but I don't really like it. I, I My path of least resistance might be just doing a limp steal. And we pick up a flush draw. Hopefully get to the river cheaply. He bets so small here, we have to call. And we hit our nuts. He bets. I should have like clicked it back here for 600, got him to call. I don't like my shove here. I'm not sure how many hands I'm getting called with. So maybe if I click it back to like 600, that would have been better. Um, C money is a reg. He also does some weird stuff against me once in a while. He will flat me and stuff like that. So, because I know I, I don't really want to raise and have that occur, I'll just make the plus EV shove on him with threes. And guy playing twenty one nine. Um, I only do really do that limp steal when I'm in awkward stacks, like 13, 14 big blinds, where we're getting a little bit too deep th that I'm comfortable with shoving. Good hands, make your standard play with your good hand, with, with the appropriate range when you have 10 big blinds. Same thing here, just ship it in, make the play. 31-6, make your standard shove here. Hit your four, no big deal. Um, not exactly sure why I raised. The only thing I could think of is I was looking at 100% fold versus steel over four hands, so maybe that's what I was looking at. But 46-7 in general, as you've seen, I'm usually in limp steel mode, so not exactly sure why I did that. Uh, reg, right around 10, 11 big blinds left behind them. Um, good spot to make this type of raise. Again, he probably assumes minimal fold equity. You're not playing post flop, so you can just raise it there. Just shoving there. Don't want to min raise. It looks way too strong. Kind of don't like when guys do that when they have like nine or ten big blinds. They have a premium hand and just min raise. I think that just looks like you have exactly what you're saying you have a uh, premium hand. A little bit different. This is a reg. I think I just make a standard shove there. Kind of an awkward situation. Not the perfect race fold spot potentially. Uh -huh. This is a spot I was perfectly prepared to race fold in. I'm sitting here with you know eight nine big blinds. I've showed the calculations on this guys. So if you think what the hell am I doing raising here? I'm absolutely race folding. I'm never race calling. Uh, until player I'm familiar with. I know him well. Um, you know, so I don't need to shove this hand. I can definitely raise fold. Sit and go series, the volume four I, that I did shows why this is a very profitable play. And I hate this play. I just did it before. The only thing I could think of of why I did this, and I do actually do this once in a while, is that that play that I did, the race fold, is effective, especially when I don't know what you're doing. If I keep doing it every time against the same player, he's probably assuming like he might have some fold equity. So maybe I just changed it up on him a little bit and shoved all in. But I would, without that reasoning, I would probably rather just do the uh, race fold. But that's probably what I was thinking there to change it up a little bit. 15-4, uh, do another race fold. Or, sorry, do a limp steal. Sorry. And getting okay odds. Try to hit. So no big deal there. 
And I'm just going to kind of skim through and see if we get any other interesting spots. Again, about 10, 11 big blinds effective. Half decent hand. Just going to ship it in. Make the plus EV play. Probably the same thing here. Yeah, standard shove. Standard shove. Looks like all these hands are getting a little bit shorter in, so these are pretty standard plays here, guys. Aces. We'll skip that hand. This is probably going to be a shove. This would most likely be a shove. Again, you know, easy scenario, random player, not do anything tricky, make the plus EV play. Even against the reg, we're a little bit short here at seven big blinds, just shipping that in. So, guys, hopefully as I was going through this, you know, you got a sense of how I'm changing up my game, depending on the players, depending on the stacks, I could care less about my hand for the most part. Um, you know, if you find that you're really just giving up way too many chips in the blinds, you know, watch this video a couple times. Watch the, the part one to this about considerations to make when you're, uh, you know, when you're in spots like this. You don't always have to fold those bad hands. If it's a really tight player, go ahead or a reg, go ahead and raise with any two cards. You know you're not going to play post flop because regs play. You know you know as a reg and a good player that you're not supposed to be calling raises. Use that to your advantage. When you have eight, nine, ten big blinds, raise with any two cards or more. You know you're at twenty five fifty. Don't be afraid to raise with any two cards. Um, you're up against a loose passive player. Raising with any two cards is not going to be too much fun because they're going to be flatting you nonstop. Do the limp steal. I typically do that limp steal when I'm. Um, would I have like an awkward stack? Uh, 13, 14 big blinds. And you hold a hand like Jack 9. Or any hand for that matter. That's like a mediocre hand. You know you don't want to shove. Raising is very awkward. Do the limp steal. Very effective. Uh, I think this is the last hand against on tilt player. I guess I was hoping for him to shove into me when I limped. So it didn't work out. So, alright guys. So, Hopefully that was helpful and that provided a good complement to uh, part one of, the, of this series here on small blind play. Um, certainly feel free to post any questions. Um, next video hopefully coming will be the uh, you know, part three of now playing in the big blind. Big blind is certainly a little bit different. Um, Going to be involving some more you know, three betting versus calling scenarios. You know, went to three bet as a bluff. Um, you know, what kind of players do we want to do it against? We'll get into all that good stuff. So, And I'll probably do the same format where I'm going to do some general strategy discussion, you know, considerations to, to um, general considerations when you're in the big blind, and then follow that up with a second part of doing all hand histories and, you know, putting that stuff into practice. So hopefully you found this helpful. Um, good luck at the tables, guys.